Hello, I'm Chief Justice Paul Newby. Article 1, Section 1 of the state constitution echoes the timeless assurances of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. famously stated that these assurances represented a promissory note to be cashed by every American. On February 2, 1960, Greensboro, North Carolina was the location where that promise was challenged. On that day, brave young men sat down at a lunch counter at a Woolworth department store. They'd been denied service on the sole basis of their skin color. Their courageous acts furthered a movement which gave fuller meaning to the phrase equal rights under the law. I'm honored to introduce Mr. Clarence Henderson. He was one of those brave young men who sat at that lunch counter and became a pioneer of the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. Hello, I'm Mel Wright with the North Carolina Chief Justice's Commission on Professionalism. I'm here today in Greensboro, in front of the Woolworth store, and here to celebrate the fact that this is Black History Month. Black History Month is extremely important because of the Civil Rights Movement and things that have taken place in the last 62 years since four young men on February the 2nd, 1960, came from North Carolina A&T to try to sit at the food counter here to be served at Woolworths. But that wasn't possible at that time. It is today. And I'm happy that you're gonna have an opportunity to hear from Mr. Clarence Henderson, who was one of those four seated at the lunch counter. I was born in a little place called Townville, South Carolina, uh, on a farm. Um, and my father was a sharecropper there and uh, I can remember uh, being about three or four years of age uh, trying to help my mother pick cotton as she walked through the cotton fields. Uh, my father actually was a sharecropper and uh, the guy that he worked for, he and the guy became very good friends and uh, ironically when I was born they had become such good friends that he named me after uh, the guy that he shared crop for, who was actually white. And I believe in divine intervention, and I think it was dropped down in my spirit to be a part of helping bridge the gap between the races. And I've, ever since I've been uh, old enough to realize that I've been involved in that kind of thing. Good. At some point, did you leave the farm and go to Greensboro? Yeah, uh, my father decided he wanted to move to Greensboro. He had a number of his relatives that moved to Greensboro, and we moved to Greensboro when I was about four or five years of age. And uh, of course, that being the, the era of time known as Jim Crow, we moved into a black neighborhood, probably the roughest neighborhood in all of Greensboro. And uh, we stayed in that area on Marsh Street for a couple of years. Uh, when I went to the third grade, my father moved us over near UNCG's campus on Oakland Avenue, which was, at that time it was a uh, women's college. And so even though I had moved out of the quote unquote black neighborhood, uh, I was bused past a number of schools where they had the segregated schools where whites went to school, back over into the same school I was going in the, in the beginning. And so actually I was bused all my life. I never went to an integrated school uh, but had the occasion, especially when we moved up on uh, Oakland Avenue, uh, I had one friend over there um, that was black, and uh, the we, were, we were in a cul-de-sac surrounded by white families. And what happened is that uh, we had a huge yard, and those, some of those black kids would come, some of the white kids would come over and play with us after we got out of school. So at, at lunchtime, I would play with the black kids at school, and then when I came home, I played with the white kids. And that's when I learned that uh, uh, racism is not something a person is born with, it's something that they're taught. Because uh, their parents didn't know where they were. We played all kinds of sports, and we never had any problems. Right. Do you remember going shopping with your mother, and at that time, how were things in Greensboro? Yeah, well, uh, Greensboro then is really sort of like it is now kind of laid back and uh, used to go with my mother downtown Greensboro, down to Woolworth specifically, uh, along with other places, and 
going to Woolworths as a young kid, and we'd go downstairs, and we saw, I saw two uh, bathrooms, one in color and one in white. And two water fountains, one saying color and one saying white. And I would look at the water coming out of those water fountains and they looked alike, so I would wonder what the difference was. So when you went upstairs, they had a lunch counter. And the certain lunch counter was segregated. Uh, uh, we could not, uh, we could order food, but had order, order to go uh, and pay the same price. And so um, I went through that for a number of years. and. I think subconsciously, when the opportunity arose, uh, uh, is when I uh, started another part of my life when I was 18 years of age. Let's talk about that when you were 18 years of age, and you mentioned Woolworths. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened. Uh, well, um, when I was growing up, um, I used to watch the a and band. I fell in love with a and through that band. As a matter of fact, I played in the band initially when I went over there. And at 18 years of age, when I was a freshman, uh, I was sitting in the lounge uh, at Bluefield Library. And Ezell Blair, who was one of the original guys that started the, uh, the, the World War City in, came and told me what they had done on the first day and asked me if I wanted to participate. And I told him, yes, I, I wanted to participate. And he said, now if uh, they serve us, uh, then I'll pay for the meal because I didn't have any money. And obviously he still owes me a meal because I never <laughs> actually ate at that lunch counter. Uh, but uh, what had happened with me was that uh, the things I'd gone through as a, as a young child growing up gave me the initiative, the desire to go and help begin to change things. And that's how it started uh, to occur. And so those guys, the four guys that started initially stayed on campus. My parents could not afford for me to stay on campus. So I didn't find out about it until the second day. And uh, what they did on the first day was they came back to campus and started to recruit people. And that's how I got involved. And so we left a and campus and walked down to uh, F.W. Woolworths. Now keep in mind I'd been there a number of times before, but this one was totally different. Walking into F.W. Woolworths not knowing how I was going to come out in a vertical position, handcuffs going to jail, or perhaps in a prone position, going to the hospital even more that changed my total outlook on life. And I began to realize that we all have defining moments. Those moments don't define us. What we do in those moments, that's what defi defines us. So we walked in uh, the Woolworths that day, sat down at a lunch counter, and uh, I caught Woolworths again by surprise. And uh, um, there were a number of people came in looking, and one of the um, members of the um, uh, police department came in and looked around and didn't say anything and uh, so we kept sitting there and it was like uh, uh, we, we were invisible. They totally ignored us and they went around and, and waited on other people but not with us. So it took 176 days of there about of that kind of movement to integrate World Wars. And so what happened was that I can remember one point in time where some 500 students or, students or people were in Woolworths and as a part of the movement. And on the side where Woolworths, Woolworths is, is that what you had was that people that were for the city and on the opposite side were people that were, from, uh, were, were against us. We were very fortunate that um, there was not uh, any deaths occurred. Some people went to jail. Uh, we faced down the KKK, had a bomb threat. Uh, but we were very persistent and said that we're going to stay here until it changes. And what actually happens is that when uh, a and went on break, then Dudley, some of the Dudley High students took over and uh, continued with the city until it was uh, uh, World War II opened up. As a matter of fact, we had a few students from uh, uh, Greensboro College, uh, Gifford College, uh, white kids came in and sat down also to um, uh, participate in the movement with us. And uh, we, we picked, Woolworths was picked because it was a chain store. And we were hopeful that it would catch on, and it did. It went all, all up down the southeastern part of, of, North, of the United States, even as far as away as, as New York, even though they were integrated there, they participated in the movement also. But one of the particular things I found out later on was that it was, it was also about economics, because, um, 
Woolworths integrated, one of the things they lost some $200,000 during that time, which would be equivalent right now to maybe $2 million or thereabout, whatever it was. And the other thing is that there was a lady that was uh, the president for, for uh, Bennett College, uh, Dr. Willoughby Player, and she had a, uh, a credit card with uh, uh, Ellis Stone across the street. And she went in there and she said that this, uh, I, she cut up a credit card and said that uh, I will not shop here any longer until you allow us to sit uh, next door. I mean, sit at, at Woolworths. And so all these things precipitated. Uh, but even though we, are, uh, it was initiated by uh, people in, in, in Greensboro, we were one of the last to be integrated. Uh, there were a number of meetings with uh, uh, the mayor and city council, but um, never came to fruition until finally they had, I think it had three people that actually had worked there as employees. They were the ones that um, actually were the first blacks to eat there. I never uh, ate there. Um, but, but at some point, they did start serving blacks. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And see, the, the, the bottom line is that it's kind of ironic in that it was 40 years before I was recognized for having participated in the movement, but I never complained because I didn't do it for any notoriety. I did it because it was the right thing to do. And uh, so it's sort of like Moses went around the wilderness for 40 years. I had a lot of time to do other things in my life that helped me prepare for uh, where my journey is right now. Right. And you went in the military. Yes. Um, when I, uh, I was in, at a and for one year, and I, I took a job uh, during the summer to go back to a &T, um, and and uh, actually to earn money at a and But uh, I had an unfortunate situation where I was right working in a, uh, a nightclub, if you will put my age up, and uh, there was a disturbance and a guy cut me from behind. So. Uh, I was not able to go back to school, so I stayed around Aunt, uh, Greensboro for a number of years, maybe two or three years, and finally said, decided I was going to leave Greensboro and go to New York and never come back again except for to visit my parents. But one of the things that was going on during that time, they had a thing called the draft. And uh, I got a call from my mother one day, and she said, I just received a letter uh, they were still living in Greensboro from Uncle Sam saying that they uh, wanted to, to talk to you. And I said, I'm not very concerned because I'm in New York and I don't know where I am. Well, about six weeks from then, I got that, that same letter, a duplicate, uh, when I lived on 117th Street in New York. And they, uh, Uncle Sam told me that he wanted to, to check me out to see if I was eligible for the draft. And so I went down, I think it was Whitehall Street in Brooklyn. There were three of us that was from Greensboro that uh, went down. I was the only one that was drafted. So from there, I was in for this culture shock because I'm living in, in, in Harlem, living the life that I thought I wanted to live. And all of a sudden, they said, we're going to put you on a twin-engine plane. The next one's where I wanted to go. The first time I'd ever flown in all of my life, and it flew me from there to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And uh, I went through my basic training there. So I'm living in the north. Uh, living uh, uh, the life, and all of a sudden I'm back in the South, not voluntarily, so I, always, I tell people, never say never. So he took me to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, but Uncle Sam wasn't through me, with me yet, because from there, he took me to Fort Gordon, Georgia. Still wasn't through with me. From there, he took me to Fort uh, Rook, Alabama, where I spent 16 months down there when George C. Wallace was a governor. And I could tell you some stories with curly hair on my head if I had any. You were talking about curly hair. Okay. I don't see any curly hair today. What were you going to tell me about curly hair? Uh, I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> uh, one of the things that happened is that uh, when uh, I was uh, stationed at Fort uh, Rook, Alabama, they were passing these little cards out uh, about the size of a business card. And I wish I would have kept one, kept one of them. It was probably worth something because the card said, um, put a white man in the White House. Vote, vote for George C. Wallace, not that end lover, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Mm. So I, I've, uh, the only difference between where I was uh, at Fort Rook, Alabama and being in a place like Vietnam is that I 
then having you know, you know, weapons to fight that, that kind of thing off. Another situation happened is that um, um, I was the uh, assistant mess sergeant uh, in the uh, place where we ate, and I was in charge of 16 GI and 16 civilian KPs. And of course, uh, you had black KPs there and white KPs. And one of the black guys came to me when they came to Miss Sergeant's office. He says, I don't want to work with that white guy no longer. And I said, well, why is that? And he said that the white guy said to him, they ought to kill all the N men and say the N women for breeding purposes. And so I went out and I asked him. He never said that he said it, because I might not be sitting here now. But those are some of the kinds of things that I went through uh, when I was there at uh, uh, Fort Brook, Alabama. As a matter of fact, there was a little place we were going to a club downtown in uh, Dothan, Alabama. And right outside of the fort was a place called Enterprise, and they had one deputy sheriff there, one sheriff there. And we came outside the gate one evening, and uh, we had a flat tire. And so we're down there changing the flat tire, and all of a sudden we look up and we see uh, this white policeman. He says, what are you boys doing? And in my mind, I'm thinking, it's obvious what we're doing with changing the tire. And what he said, I can remember it like it was yesterday. He said, you need to have that tire changed before the sun goes down. I don't know what would happen if we did get the tire changed. And so um, after going through those kind of things, now, um, they paid my way, uh, they, 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 they flew me from New York to Fort Jackson. But when I got out of the military, they gave me just enough money to get back to Greensboro and send me back where I came from, but I didn't argue because I was glad to get out of there. Uh, and so I have uh, drawn upon those kind of things to, to, to talk with people about the America that was versus the America that is now. It has changed dramatically for the better. And let me say this. Uh, if I had a choice, I would still want to be born in, 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 in the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. Not perfect, imperfect, but the greatest country in the world uh, where you have, we have more freedom here than we have any place else. Uh, and we need to realize when it comes to freedom, that freedom is not free. You have to defend it almost on a daily basis for our individual rights. So. Uh, Hopefully, a part of my history will let people know that uh, in America, you have to take advantage of the opportunity that America offers because the opportunity is there, but you have to take advantage of it. And, and at one point, you were a part of the Martin Luther King movement. Yeah. During that time that you're talking about. Well, well actually, what happened was is that there were a number of years before that um, uh, I came back to Greensboro uh, and use my GI Bill to go back and complete my degree. Because the first year I went there, I, I, I chose uh, the, the major of chemistry simply because one of my friends uh, chose chemistry and I couldn't stand chemistry. So when I came back out, when I came out, I decided I would go and, into business administration. And uh, I took a full-time load I uh, actually worked uh, eight and ten hours a night, went to school full time, and graduated from a and in less than two years. Just dropped my entire social life. And after I completed that, I uh, worked a number of jobs, finally wound up going into the financial services industry, where I participated in another uh, type of movement to begin to teach people how a lot of times the financial services industry will take advantage of you. And I started out with a company uh, it was named A.L. Williams, and later on they changed it over to Prime America. And so it taught me a great deal about the economy and how America, America, the American economy works. Uh, but back to when I was in a I went to A&T the second time, uh, I started back, I started there in 1969. And about March of there about, uh, there was a riot on campus. And uh, it taught me the difference between a peaceful movement and a movement that, that was violence. And at that point, Governor Scott was the governor of the state of North Carolina. And he said, if the riot does not cease, I will bring tanks on this campus and I will level the, the campus. And so what would have happened to all of the students there if that would have happened? Nobody would have gotten an education. 
and I was a mentor, member of a veterans club, and we had a meeting. Uh, one of the guys said, "Well, why don't we? Uh, we, you know, we came out of the military. We know how to use weapons, and some of us have weapons. Why don't we go out there and and uh, defend the campus?" And I said, "With well, what?" I said, "You're t- talking about 38 to 45. These guys got all this artillery, and so thankfully that that did not occur. Uh, but." Um, what we saw there was there was still that Jim Crow type of mentality. You see, when I look at uh, segregation and Jim Crow, it was just one step up from uh, slavery. But the resiliency of the of the black community has shown itself uh, as reared its head out during the time uh, from slavery time up to now. But they don't talk about that. They want to call us victims, uh, survivors. I'm not either one of those. I am an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb, the word of my testimony. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Black History Month gives the people an opportunity to um, see what Black History is all about. If you don't know the history, you're doomed to repeat it. Uh, it seems to be that, that, that every generation thinks that history began with them, and it really didn't. And so when you go back and read the truth, you find truth is stranger than fiction because you see the courage that was required uh, that we need to have that same kind of courage now to continue to defend this country.